Welcome to a brand new series here on Telil Community Television, The Front Porch. I'm your host, Adam Cook. Over the coming weeks, you're going to hear and see the experiences of newcomers, immigrants, and settlers to our communities here in the Strait. And you'll also hear the stories of those working to bring these folks here and help them get settled into our communities. We hope that this is going to give you a bigger cultural understanding of the many faces that make up our communities these days, and as well to hear the joys, triumphs, challenges, defeats, and overall hopes and dreams of those who have chosen to make Richmond County and the Strait area their new home. We begin with a visit to the Friends United Cultural Center in Cleveland. That's where we'll find owner-operator Ralph Bauman, who has also been the head of Canadian Pioneer Estates for the past 32 years. As such, he has some keen insights on the challenges faced by newcomers to our area, especially where it comes to non-resident property taxation, an issue that came up big in the last provincial budget, but was ultimately reversed and modified by Premier Tim Houston and his PC government. How has this impacted the overall outlook for those wishing to move to our area and also those hoping to set up shop right here and make this place their new, perhaps permanent home? For the answers, I sat down with Ralph Bauman just recently at the Friends United Center in Cleveland. Here is that conversation beginning the front porch right now. Well, certainly the first thing that definitely came to my mind, somebody did something without any consultation of the public whatsoever. So I was not impressed. Um, quite frankly, four or five premiers before it entertained the same idea. They all clearly said no. It even was in the election platform of the Ham government. But once they came to government, they realized this was not the way to go. So doing this such quickly and two taxes at the same time, I thought was very hastily decided. Now, you mentioned that previous provincial governments have tried to install these types of measures for non-resident property owners. And I want to frame the next question in the context that you have been running Canadian Pioneer Estates since the late 80s. You've been here for 32 years. Correct. So with that in mind, I'm wondering what you feel leads provincial governments or any levels of government to look at the non-resident property owner as a potential source for tax revenue and makes them think that they can sell this kind of a move as being politically popular to the general public? Well, that's a good question. Let me start there. I think if anybody does something this quickly, it is, I think in this case, for two reasons. One, the government really needs taxes very desperately, obviously. We're in the middle of COVID-19, and that would no doubt have reduced the tax revenue for any government globally significantly. So that's obviously one thing. The second thing is the concern was, at least as far as I understand, that the government wanted to make housing more affordable for young families. And that's a very um, commendable, a very good thing to do. Um, and so I see where it came from. The question is how it was done. Critics of these new measures have also suggested that they won't actually achieve the provincial government's stated goal of trying to alleviate a housing crisis in Nova Scotia. You yourself have suggested there's a discrepancy between these two goals. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, of course there is. Um, I'm trying to tell a client who wants to actually build a house, and that's not constructed yet, obviously, that if he's going to build a house, then he's, through that, contributing to a housing crisis, maybe in Halifax, and my client doesn't understand it. Quite frankly, I don't. If a person constructs new houses around here and you want to punish them with a 2% tax annually for doing so, I have no idea what it's all about. We have seen in the past too often that even on residents live in a house for 5 to 10 years, then they sell it. It's not as if they take it outside the country. So what happens then, it goes back into Canadian hands and Nova Scotian hands. So obviously, these people have in many ways contributed to employment, to taxes. But one thing they certainly have not done was to take housing away. So this had no logic whatsoever. One has to understand there were two taxes specifically here. The 2% tax made no sense to me whatsoever. I do, however, agree with the second tax. The second tax was a different nature. I've seen too often, we don't sell houses, we just develop land, and we're not even brokers as such. 
we only develop our own land. So I've seen too often Halifax was a classic example, but elsewhere in Canada where young families wanted to actually buy a home, somebody put that home on the market and there was a bidding war, people speculating with the house. And then of course the house was so expensive, it could have been a house for $500,000 on the market, let's say in Halifax, which would have ended up being seven or 800000 just a few weeks after in terms of sales. This was unheard of, however it happened. And I can see where the government had to intervene. So a 5% tax, call it the transfer tax, I love. That makes perfect sense because what it really does essentially, it uh, keeps people from speculating or at least it makes, us, it makes it less attractive. And I think when the government thought about this one, this was very smart. It was very well done. I concur 100% when you have an existing house presumably even Halifax, where the majority of the Nova Scotian population lives, and you suddenly have people bidding on that significantly all the time, it's difficult. So if you want to slow the housing market down, I think the 5% is a good start. Should it be more? I don't know, but it's 5%. So that tax, I agree with 100%. It's a one-time tax, which you really would have to pay when you record your deed and secure ownership in such a way. But again, I do not agree with the 2% tax annually for people who are going to build houses in the future, or for that matter, they just might have built houses recently. I don't see how somebody who builds their own house, the first time owner, the first time resident, if you would like to call it that, how they would, with house construction, have or would be contributing to any housing crisis. So that was just no point. And to me, that was an excuse I couldn't let, I couldn't let stand. Mr. Bauman, you've used the word discrimination to describe the provincial government's actions towards non-resident property owners, and I wanted to get a sense from you as to what people in your community, both those that do business with you and those from around Cape Breton and around the province, were saying to you once these measures were originally announced in the provincial budget earlier in the spring. What was the reaction? Well, it's quite simple. We have to look at the federal level. The government just recently had implemented even the, I think it was called the Emergency Act in, in, uh, in Ottawa. Some people felt it was overdone. I don't know, I'm not a politician, I don't want to judge that, but it was certainly done without the consultation of many people. That's the federal level. Shortly after now, um, the provincial government decides something over everybody's head. So what happens is when you have governments like that, people start losing faith in those governments from outside the country because they should be consulting at all levels all the time. And our clients were quite, quite frankly worried about this. So, um, of course, somebody from, let's say, Ontario would know um, more about Canada, but people from outside the country just don't. And um, any time when governments act, abruptly without consulting anybody, it uh, makes people insecure. It makes investors insecure. It makes people think, is this the actual place I would like to live? If people can be decided over my head just like it. These were just two examples I gave. I just, they came together pretty quickly. So our clients, but many people I spoke to in general were worried about too much government interference. So I learned in school a long time ago government should provide an atmosphere in which business and families can thrive and both, um, well, maybe were not the perfect decisions. Again, I'm not a politician, so I'm certainly not uh, at the federal level anywhere. And whether that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, I don't know. Um, I just hear and see what other people say. So I've simply observed. As far as the provincial level go, I will see again the one tax, the 5%, one-time tax, I concur, it's a good thing, but not the 2% tax. And if you want to send the message to people that this province, or this country for that matter, is a good place to live, to invest in, it's, it's, it's friendly, it's just good, and very hospitable, then you want to make sure you send that message genuinely. And that means the government should also project such a thing. Now again, coming back to the tax, because that's a different issue, one must certainly understand it is very difficult to be a government leader these days. These days, um, 
Never mind politics. I mean, there is Tim Houston out there now who is a very good man as far as I can see it. And one has to admit the same thing goes for Alan McMaster. Um, to make a mistake is one thing, but then listening to your constituents is another one. Then to admitting it's wrong and then to fixing it takes a great man and a great government. So in all honesty, I really would like to give Tim Houston a lot of credit for that including Alan McMaster, and Trevor Budger was also very instrumental and pivotal here. I think that we have a really good voice in Halifax with Trevor. Trevor listened, Trevor understood. And I mean, one has to look at the nature of his job. Initially, Trevor is a doctor, and so that means he wants to heal, he wants to help, and that's exactly what he did here. He uh, healed and he um, helped talking to the government it was really good. But to make a long story short, and I said it at the beginning of the interview, all governments these days are up against the wall with the finances. If you have less taxes than ever before, but at the same time you have high inflation and rising costs from that for everybody, it makes it very difficult. So I believe this tip of the iceberg on a global level where governments will have to raise taxes significantly more yet. Not because they want to, I mean, nobody wants to raise taxes, right? But sometimes it has to be. When I came to Canada 30 some years ago, I recall, I believe it was Brian Maroney who introduced the GST. People were against it, but yet if they had not done so, things would have been pretty rough for Canada. And in the future years, and Paul Martin, others, of course, could work with that. We needed the extra revenue. It's undeniable that hundreds of billions of dollars in federal revenue would have been lost had the goods and services tax not gone through. That's correct. Now, you just mentioned Richmond MLA Trevor Boudreau, who was willing to take on members of his own government caucus to try to reverse the measures that Minister Alan McMaster introduced in his budget in the spring. We also saw concerted efforts from across Nova Scotia, led by the municipality of Chester, but also picked up here locally by Richmond County Warden Amanda Mumberkett and her council. Can you tell me a little bit about what it meant to you to see elected officials on several different levels willing to fight this and try to reverse it? That's actually a very interesting question. The first of all, we all worked really well together. You just spoke of Amanda Mumbercat. That's another person who is very competent, really knows what she's doing. I spoke to her, and I think we all could pretty fast c concur. Something had to be changed here. I spoke to some mayors too, and um, things did happen. So we have good representation on those levels, and that's the really important part. Coming together is the important part. We did. Again, the government listened. And by the way, if anything, our clients from outside the country said, listen, if there's a government, I just talked about this before, that makes a mistake, looks into it, listens to the constituents, changes it and admits that, that takes great people. So actually our clients from all across the world thought that the Houston government did something really great here because most government leaders in the world today are so detached from their own constituents, don't listen anymore don't care when they make mistakes and certainly don't admit that. Um, it actually gave our clients even a bit of a boost. They said, listen, this is a great province. If we can still talk to people, the politicians listen. And that's one thing, really. Um, they're all people, or like all people of the people, work with the people, from the people. Again, through all this, El McMaster had called me too. He said, please explain to me what this is all about in your personal view. I mean, why does it happen that the Minister of Finance calls you when you have a discussion? Um, and of course, Tim Houston had been our culture center here before it became um, premier. To me, he sounded like a very down-to-earth person. Um, and same thing, of course, I had known Trevor Budo for a long time before. Um, but we have to understand um, their jobs are tough. Being a premier or any other government job in, in, in that regard with so much responsibility comes with a 14 hour day, at least seven days a week. I spoke with former premiers to know. So they actually really, sure they probably make good money, I don't know, um, but they really have to care about their people, their constituents to do this, to have this job. You will never see that all people are gonna like you, that's impossible, but at the same time, and that's the one thing 
in the future any government will have to raise taxes yet it becomes obvious now we have lived on the back of our future generations for too long we have taken more debt loan the governments have and that's because quite frankly people think they have an incredible sense of entitlement donald trump i'm not a fan of his but he wrote in one of his books the problem with today's society is that many people have an incredibly great sense of unjustified entitlement and that's the problem people want good roads good hospitals snow plowing that's all a global thing good schools good universities good everything but they often don't want to pay for it and then if and when they don't then they're gonna take loans out which really the government has to of course take loans out and now with a higher interest rate out it's going to be rougher so we are indebting our future generations and that does not seem to be a good thing I spoke to Steve McNeil not too long ago and his government was able to, and I, I think um, Ian Rankin was here last week, he said the same thing, his government was able to balance the budget and that's good. I really, really respect that as I did respect Paul Martin for that. Um, however, we have to look also now in these times, it's almost impossible two years of COVID-19 and other things to have a balanced budget. So they do the best they can if they're gonna raise taxes more I don't like it, but yet, unless we want our future generations to pay for something, we need to start doing it now. We have to be frugal and really think about what we spend money on. And if they have to raise taxes, that's even okay. But let's talk about how, when, and why, and where. So really, it's about the consulting. I almost want to guarantee you, I haven't talked to the Premier about that or Al McMaster. But as here, or other governments globally, I talk to many government leaders all due to our jobs here, and they are going to raise taxes. There is just no choice. And they're going to have to, again, implement measures where they can save more money. So let's see where it goes. No premier will like raising taxes. I mean, nobody wants to do that, but you might have to. And again, you might not be liked by everybody, but some things have to happen sometimes. Just please do it with consulting the public so you can do it in the least painful way possible. Mr. Bellman, from the outside looking in, it seems to me that non-resident property tax owners here in Nova Scotia and also those from around the country and around the world have responded well to the idea that the Premier and the Minister of Finance were willing to listen yes. and to make changes so that only the deed transfer tax remains. So it seems that what could have been a potential public relations nightmare for Nova Scotia, as we saw opinions being inflamed about the province in different parts of Canada and around the world, has not only managed to become salvageable in terms of the province's reputation, but might even have the effect of enhancing Nova Scotia's reputation. Well, see, I concur 100%. The thing is, one has to look at the fact we're trying to build the future of our children together and our grandchildren in this province and globally. That means we're going to talk to each other and we're going to learn from each other. And when we make mistakes, we own up to them and we try to fix them. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I think this was for the government in the end a very good thing because the one tax was smart and it really did exactly um, achieve what they were trying to do, slow certain housing markets down. And if not has already, it certainly will, including with the high interest rates coming. So that was definitely a good thing. But I think on top of that, yes, I think it gave everybody a, a lot of confidence in the government, the way they listened. So we're here to work with the government in the future. And I truly believe that this government and including former ones were not detached from reality they just have to face certain facts and then make certain decisions and that's important um, of course the longer you are in government or premier whatever you might be the more ways of, e of, of eventually um, or the more time to, to look back upon where maybe less people like what you did but I mean again we cannot do a health care system and pave roads and, and, and all of it together People can have different priorities and different parties can, but ultimately they're going to find themselves in the same kind of debt that the predecessors left and with the same taxes or tax revenue they have unless they want to change that. So coming back to your question, yes, I think that was an incredible boost that uh, the Houston government gave, well, actually to itself, but everybody else, to the province. 
um, it, it was a good thing, um, handling things the way I handled them. So that, that was good. Now, it may be difficult to put an actual dollar figure on the answer to this next question, so I don't want you to put a dollar figure on the answer to this question, but can you give me a ballpark estimate or even just a general comment on the damage that these measures could have caused to the economy here in Richmond County, not just in terms of real estate holdings and property holdings, but also the day-to-day -day life here in the county? Well, again, the 5% makes perfect sense that you transfer tax. That's good. It actually slows things down where people speculate less with houses. Again, our clients would not have. We only develop land and help people to build houses. So that's one thing. The 2% tax would have been detrimental. Eight clients of ours had canceled the houses. I mean, eight. And more would have followed. Others would have sold their houses. And, and, and. So then of course that sends a ripple effect into everywhere else. People have a house, might buy a car, they might buy a boat, they go to restaurants, you name it. If a province or any government sends out a message of we don't want you or we only want you if you pay more money than anybody else, which is really kind of discriminating, um, then that's not a good thing. So this tax would have definitely led to many people losing their jobs to the municipalities losing a lot of tax revenue. And not just that, our First Nation Center, Friends United, our Friends United International Convention Center here, we operate often from our, or mainly from our, our corporate group. So a lot of that is land development. If that would have ceased to, to be, we could not have funded the initiative anymore. That means probably 30 artists, indigenous, would have lost their livelihood and um, not just that, the center would have closed down. I mean, many people come here, we never charge anybody to use a center. We feel it's important for the world to see indigenous art and culture and heritage. So since we don't charge anything, of course, we have also no revenue. In fact, we have only ever cost, and that's okay. But our business and the land development could actually carry those costs. If that would have dried up, it would have closed the center down for good. And again, many First Nations friends, artists would have lost their job. So this would have gone much far beyond, I think, what the Houston government would have wanted. Uh, they wanted, I think, extra tax revenue, and that's fine. And again, they might have to get it elsewhere, and that's probably fine. But if that had gone through and they would have left it, not good. I mean, in all fairness, they already had, I think, made a concession where they were going to have some... Um, amounts that would not be affected. I think the first hundred to two hundred thousand dollars for a house by this tax. But then they saw light at the end of the tunnel. They saw wisdom, and they understood even that would have sent the wrong message. So they completely eliminated the tax. So again, we're very grateful. Not just myself, all the First Nations artists here, but all the local contractors we work with. And there are so many in Richmond County, in Vernes County, Cape Breton County. Sometimes I mean, it even goes into. Guys from and and uh, and Ignish County, it would have, it would have done, it would have had definitely the, uh, like definitely the, the the opposite effect if they had gone through the tax. So, Mr. Bellman, as we wind down this interview, let's look ahead to the future. We've already come through a difficult two years in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. That has complicated things in terms of being able to welcome newcomers to our area. And for yourself, from a purely business perspective, I imagine it has been difficult as well. Coming out of that period, we see this difficult discussion in terms of non-resident property owners and appropriate taxation measures for non-resident property owners. Where do you feel we go from here in terms of the discussions that have been held and about the changes that have been made to these government policies over the past couple of months? Well, first of all, I hope the Houston government is going to be around for a long time since they apparently listen well and can change things. Um, I think for the future, we can just take away from this that if we work together constructively and consult and treat each other respectfully, um, which is all common sense in the first place, then I think we can go very, very far ahead. Now, I've been a person to always stay out of politics. That just how I've always been. Our center never took any government funding, and that was important for us too, because too often I've seen globally 
certain projects being funded by governments and once the funding dries up the project falls apart so we didn't want that we rather grow, grow slow without any government assistance but we grow slowly and steadily than having very unhealthy growth which is too fast due to all kinds of government grants and that falls apart so i see many good things for the future um when people stick their heads together work together one has to understand however we live in unprecedented times um, things are going to get a lot rougher before they're going to get better and that's because of everything on a global level we can talk about wars we can talk about inflation we can talk about money printing which leads to inflation we can talk about a lot of people who are very desperate probably due to finances you see this in the united states all the mass shootings um, there is so much going on and it's up to us to have peace in our heart and to do yes even business but with a long-term vision it's really important in business that both people at the end of the day when they do business have a advantage from it and they're happy with it and that's i think a big thing um and that's what worries me today when politicians and countries talk to each other or even don't talk to each other for that matter i have the wrong people talk to each other um things go wrong quite a bit so the one thing i'm looking forward to the future but i see i see a time where we all have to like where we all have to stick together really closely because it's going to get rough more taxes less revenue and whatnot but it's it's okay again we can do it together this has been a very thoughtful and enlightening conversation ralph bauman so thank you very much for welcoming the front porch to the friends united center in cleveland today please come back anytime already looking forward to it thank you again and that wraps up this week's edition of the front porch thank you to ralph bauman for giving us an opportunity to speak with him about these many issues and of course, if you have any thoughts or suggestions about what you'd like to see on the front porch in the coming weeks, feel free to contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also forward your suggestions and your thoughts about this particular show to Talil Community Television in Arishat, the station phone number is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. Don't forget to follow Telil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to find every single episode of The Front Porch, including this one, as well as all the other productions that Telil puts together on a weekly and monthly basis. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you for joining me on The Front Porch this week. I look forward to seeing you again next time with a brand new show. Bye for now.